All right, so let's get started. Uh, I see some questions already rolling in. I'll get to those in a second. Uh, my name is Edward Anthony Polanco, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of History. On behalf of the Department of History, the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, and Virginia Tech at large, I, I welcome you all to this panel. Um, before we get started, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the Tudela Monacan people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudela Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, one of the questions already asked, and I'll kind of hit that point now, is that this video or this uh, event will be recorded. It's being recorded and it will be available to the public in hopefully about a week or so, if not a little bit sooner than that. Um, unfortunately, this event live will not have closed captioning, but the video will have closed captioning and, and we apologize for, for us not having that during this live event, but that will be rectified in, in the recording. Um, we have four great speakers here for you all today to, to enjoy some, some very informative uh, conversation here. We have, um, Ashley Reichelman, um, TJ, <coughs> and Talby, Talby Edmondson, and uh, Penny Blue. TJ Talley, sorry, I apologize about missing the, the last name there. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, Ashley. Uh, Ashley is an assistant professor of sociology at Virginia Tech. Her research concerns race and memory and commemoration, including a uh, publication she's finishing up based on interviews uh, on Charlottesville and Statue. So I'm gonna move this over to her and go ahead. Okay, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Polanco and uh, to the history department and all the sponsors of the event. My hope right now is that you can see this uh, PowerPoint presentation that I have posted. Uh, TJ, just let me know. So that, that's super helpful. So I just want to start um, by saying, again, thank you to the History Department, the other sponsors, and the other panelists. I'm humbled to be included with them since I'm very much a student in this area and very much at the beginning stages of this particular research project in terms of its analysis. So as Dr. Polanco said, I um, more broadly study the effects of representation of past violence on local communities specifically focusing on race relations and memorialization. So my goal is to understand how the visualization of a collective memory affects intergroup relationships vis-a-vis -vis views of individual, the individual self and groups. Before though delving into some recent work on the Confederate statues in local communities, I think it's important to address some brief historical facts, uh, as well as some factors that are important in contextualizing the modern debate. So in order for us to understand the present, we have to understand the past. And uh, doing so requires us to understand certain factors. So I will never be able to do justice to the history uh, of the statues, as well as the more broader history of the Civil War. But I do encourage you to check out some of the historians yeah, in the blue box on the left of my screen, who have produced some more modern public accessible work on being able to talk about the relationship between the past and the present in the context of these statues. First, I want to acknowledge that this debate that is having that we're having about Confederate statues uh, actually involves two different types of statues. So the first are monuments. These are more large scale, uh, grandiose monuments that are often in city centers uh, or in the middle of uh, large roadways to generals or leaders of the Confederacy. So Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. And then on the right, you will see an example of a statue that only yesterday, uh, and I don't know the outcome of it, they were having a discussion about uh, in Floyd County about whether this decision to remove the common soldier statue will be on the ballot in November. So these statues are smaller in smaller towns and they are known to be listed as two quote local common soldiers. And these are the focus of my research. So what I think is just really quick to contextualize as a sociologist and someone who is looking to understand the effect of memorialization and statues, 
on modern race relations, there are a few uh, factors that I think are important to contextualize in terms of thinking about this debate. So uh, the first is we need to ask the question uh, of any, uh, any statue that we are looking at about when the structures were placed. Uh, so in the context of this, as well as not only the timing, what was the political climate when they were placed? For the common soldier statues, it's important for us to understand that their placement did not occur in a vacuum. We need to understand the full history surrounding it. So, uh, sorry, particularly for the timing of these, uh, they occurred largely after the conclusion of Reconstruction. So the majority of common soldier statues were built and Confederate symbolism in public spaces were placed between the 1890s and 1920s, and a second smaller wave occurred in the 1960s. The Southern Poverty Law Center produced a quite complex map as well as a timeline that's valuable to see this. But in the context of what's important for us to understand for race relations, all of these points between the 1890s and the 1920s and the 1960s were crucial points when Black Americans were pushing for and achieving certain equal rights. So this was not occurring in a vacuum, their placement for thinking about the common soldier Confederate statues. The second is where were the structured structures placed? Most of these common soldiers are on public land. Certainly the ones that we are having more community-wide debates on were on public land and currently sit on courthouse uh, lawns. The third and fourth factors that are important for us to consider are more in the context of me thinking of as a social scientist, but are also valuable for us to consider as historians, humanists, uh, and politicians, and just uh, informed and educated community members. So the first is, what do the structures actually represent? And in other words, whose history do they represent? In the debate of my world, this is the understanding between history and collective memory, right? The juxtaposition between these. When we think about uh, statues and representations from a social science standpoint, we often think about them as being a reflection of the maker, as well as a reflection of the time rather than the event that they are remembering. So in the context of the common soldiers, these were paid for by, in most cases, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was an organization that was started after, uh, uh, around the start of Reconstruction, possibly a little bit before. And for this reason, many of the statues were also mass produced, so many of them look quite similar. These statues, in the context of thinking about history versus memory, were also coupled with a push uh, by the UDC, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, to reframe the Civil War's cause. So specifically in conjunction with raising funds for the statues, the UDC made a push for what we would more recently know as, quote, the lost cause narrative uh, to be written into Southern textbooks. So for those of you who have not heard of the term or are not uh, aware of the term lost cause, it generally refers to a mythology or a narrative about the Civil War that downplays or completely omits slavery as a core cause and reasoning. And it kind of raises the question of which cause came first or which was the driving cause of the Civil War. Uh, the fourth, uh, and embedded within this, is the question of is the history contested when we think about statues and representations? And the last is, what are the variety of modern interpretations that we could have of the statue? As a sociologist, my area of focus is symbolic interactionism and social psychology. And what I am trying to understand is what do the statues mean to the public? And how can we think about how they use those statues in their daily life to understand the meanings that they imbue in them? What is important for us to know about symbols is they have meanings um, that vary and those meanings can change over time. This means that they are political by nature by the fact that their meanings can change. So this, by political, I don't mean political in a pejorative sense, but rather I mean the recognition that we all, as individuals and groups, use symbols to convey deeper meanings about ourselves and about our values. So no matter where you stand in the debate about current Confederate statues and their placement, it's really important that we understand the statue means, quote, something to everyone, and we need to recognize thus that these statues will be and are interpreted differently by different people and those uh, different interpretations will change across time. 
So in the context of thinking about my research specifically, where do I fit in in understanding this? So my research tries to understand this a little bit more about this last question of symbolism. I'm interested in knowing how people actually learned about these interpretations. It's not as if we're just born with them and they exist, right? We are socialized into them in some way, or we are actually actively educated on these interpretations. So in other words, my research is trying to answer the question of how do local residents actually come to imbue meanings in their statues. So uh, about a year after Charlottesville, I uh, located, I selected three towns, three local towns that had one of the approximately 70 common soldier statues that currently sit in Virginia. And I decided that I wanted to spend some time observing the statue as well as interviewing local residents. So it's really important for me to share with you now as a side note, any of the pictures you see are not representations of any of the towns that I was in. And it's important for you to know that there's no point in trying to pick out which towns in Virginia I was looking at because none of those of them are featured in the terms of this PowerPoint presentation because the overall goal is to understand overriding patterns rather than specifics in any of these individual communities. So I spent about 30 hours observing uh, the statues in total uh, and people's interactions with them, as well as about, uh, I conducted about a total of 20 interviews with local residents across these three towns. And one of the ways in which we can understand meaning, as I mentioned previously, is to understand how the statues are actually used by the public currently. So there's two ways that we can think about the statues being used currently. The first is through individual interaction. So how people individually interact with it. And the second is in which way is it either used by the community or the center of community use in a particular event. So when we think about interactions, individual interactions across my observations, uh, consistently the only people interacting with the statue where they were explicitly interacting with the statue, reading it, taking photos of it, uh, standing in front of it and trying to take, uh, take some information from it were largely tourists as evidenced by their taking pictures in front of it as well as out of, uh, out of state license plates. So the other element to understand is of the interviews that I did of the 20 people, approximately 40% of locals had said uh, they had never been to the statue or looked at it before the interview meaning that they don't even know uh, in some ways have, they don't even have personal meaning of the statue in their local community, so much as a broader meaning about what the statues as a whole mean to them. So this fits into a larger uh, understanding that's happening right now is a lot of, a lot of communities don't even recognize that they have a common soldier statue as a part of their local landscape. And as one of my respondents, James Frank said, it's really just an obstacle on the lawn. So if they did have individual interaction with the statue, largely this was talked about as some sort of field trip that they took as a young child, either to this particular uh, courthouse in these towns that I was looking at, or to another statue that sat on a courthouse where they went to elementary school. In terms of community use, there were two ways that the statue was used. The first was, uh, it was either the center of a veterans commemoration where the statue was utilized as a representation of Confederate veterans that were being uh, remembered, or it took the Confederate, uh, I'm sorry, the veterans commemoration took place on the lawn and therefore the statue was overlooking it in some way in terms of its placement. The second is just the fact that because these are in town centers and they're in front of courthouses in small communities, these are often the centers of these small communities. And in many ways, this statue holds a central place in the local town events as either the center of a festival or an exhibit. So despite this lack of interaction that individuals have had with statues, many people, however, had very clear views about what the statue actually represented. So it's important that you remember this is qualitative research, which means I was looking for a, val a quality or an in-depth answer rather than the broad, more uh, ways in which we can generalize answers. So of the 20 respondents, there were four different general categories of meaning that they imbued in the statue. 
So uh, the first was about 45% of the respondents, so that's about nine people, saw the statue as solely a memorial. So in the context of what I do, there's a distinction between a memorial and a monument. A monument is to the victor, it's to a hero. Uh, a memorial is to the victim, right? Someone who had, uh, has lost something or someone as a result of a tragedy or a result of circumstance. So in this context, the wide majority of uh, the largest meaning that was imbued on the statue was ultimately a memorial. And some people saw it as similar to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, or alternatively as something that we could think about as when we honor modern uh, war heroes, or I'm sorry, when we honor modern veterans who return from war, it would be similar to that. The second was about 25% of respondents saw it as some combination of a memorial or a monument. So in this way, uh, it was a combination of remembering heroes as well as remembering the ways in which they've died. Uh, this particular respondent, Manchester, says it was a memorial to a principal, right? Which means that a certain principal died in the context of this war, and thus we are remembering that. The fourth, uh, I'm sorry, the third was about 20% of respondents actually saw it as a, a distortion of memory. Uh, so when we think about this, there were three common distortions that were discussed. One is that only one side is shared. So by this narrative, uh, African Americans and enslaved, enslaved uh, persons were left out of the narrative entirely, right? As in the context of the, the war. The second is that the statue had a different, has a different meaning now. It's taken on a different meaning. And therefore, uh, we need to think more deeply about that, how that may have distorted the memory. And the third, which I didn't include, is what I already referenced. The idea that the statues were placed earlier uh, during certain periods of time for the purposes of division. The fourth and least, least agreed upon was the strict historical representation. The fact that these statues were placed during history, right, years ago, and therefore they should stay simply because they were accepted then, and we need to understand that they should stay there now. So the question that we can ask as we kind of go through these, and again, we're at early stages of analysis, the question that I think is valuable for us to understand about Confederate commemoration in academic spaces is how can we think about Confederate statue meaning making and its relationship to the role of formal education? So there's just two short things that I wanna share with you and then um, on to the last slide to move on to the next person. So the first is about content. So when you look at what people learned as children about the cause of the Civil War, um, about 65% of respondents learned that slavery was in whole or in part a cause of the Civil War, meaning that 35% of respondents were not taught that slavery had any role in being the cause of the Civil War. But when we look about at the role of formal education, there is another pattern that actually seems to emerge in this smaller data set of 20 respondents. And it has to do with the relationship between the cause that people were taught as a child during formal education, what they currently believe to be the cause of the Civil War, and if they currently support the statue or not. So we broke this into two groups. Uh, ultimately, there were 10 in each group. 10 respondents learned that there was only one sole cause of the Civil War. And, and in most cases, this was either they were solely taught it was about slavery or solely taught it was about states' rights. The other group was taught that there were either multiple causes of the Civil War or that there was no clear cause. They actually were just taught it in a vacuum. So the relationships that we found were that singularly, those people who were taught a singular cause are more likely as adults to believe that slavery was not a part of the cause at all, even if they learned slavery to be the sole cause as a child. And a wide majority of those people uh, believe that the statue should remain without any changes to it. It should just exist in its current form. The second group who learned either multiple or no causes are more likely to believe that slavery is in whole or in part a cause of the war. And their current support of the statue is either that they are ambivalent towards it and therefore they're okay with whatever happens to it, or they are willing to move and contextualize it. So again, these are smaller groups and we're looking for patterns to understand processes and themes. 
One other important factor to think about just very quickly is 35% uh, of our sample was over the age of 70. And as I mentioned, the UDC pushed a certain educational platform. So these respondents primarily learned from both formal education and their parents. And 85% of these respondents support the statute and currently believe that slavery was not a cause of the war in any form. So how does this then relate to symbolism in academic settings? It's really important to understand that statues on public property indirectly by being on public property make them part of academic settings. For instance, when we think about the role of education, we learn in formal and informal ways, both in and outside of the classroom. So in some ways, our social educations, which some might refer to as public education, or a, a term that I might use is socialization, are just as powerful as the formal education platforms that we learn in. So in what ways are we socialized into what I would refer to as memory scapes? We learn what is accepted in our communities by the memories that are imbued in the community's landscapes. Therefore, when we go into formal academic settings and see symbols like these, such as on college campuses, like where Silent Sam stood, the Confederate monument on the University of North Carolina's campus, we are indirectly taught or maybe even blatantly informed of two facts about these communities where we are to learn and be challenged academically. The first fact by the presence of the memorial or the monument is the narrative of the Civil War was a singular cause which disproportionately results in people believing slavery was not a factor. And in a cyclical fashion, Ben indicates that the community supports uh, in some way, right, what the statue represents and the statue itself. And the second fact is that slavery's role in the Civil War and its modern legacy will remain as silent as Sam did on UNC's campus for years to come. Both of these facts in terms of race and memory disproportionately affect and ignore African Americans in the role of race in the history of the United States. And they provide an incomplete narrative about the complicated past that we have yet to come to terms with. So I just appreciate your time and I just want to acknowledge uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences uh, and the Center for the Humanities funded the research as well as I want to just thank my uh, graduate student TA Whitney Hayes, as well as again the history department for giving me the opportunity to share some work with you and learn from you all. Thank you very much, Ashley. That was great. Um, one thing I'll mention before we continue is that there is a Q&A option that many of you have uh, hopefully seen. We encourage you to send in any questions you might have. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We can't get to all of them because of uh, time restrictions, but please send them in and, and we'll try to answer those. Um, our next speaker is TJ. Uh, he is an assistant professor of African history at uh, the University of San Diego in San Diego, California. Uh, prior to joining USD, he was fa a faculty member at Washington and Lee, one of the centers for Confederate memorialization in higher education. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's very surreal still sort of thinking about it. It's been two years now since I've moved from uh, Lexington, Virginia to San Diego. And as we know, they're pretty much the exact same place. That is a lie. Um, so it'll be very interesting sort of to, to talk about and think about that. So, and once again, I want to thank um, the History Department of Virginia Tech. And I want to, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to sort of think through and process a lot of this um, with you all and to have a really productive discussion. And um, I think my my talk dovetails really well with Ashley's, which was really helpful and really thoughtful. So um, I'm going to try as well. Um, I feel a bit like a fourth grade substitute teacher trying to work technology, but let's see if we can make this work. There's always this sort of moment of panic as I'm trying to, there we go. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Perfectly. Is it all right? Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about today, a little bit about my own work and sort of experientially what it was like to be a queer identified uh, African American professor of African history at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. To begin, it was wild. Um, so let's talk about, um, so I, I began thinking about my own research and the way that I, I wanted to apply it and think about it in this space. So the talk today is called Dismembering and Remembering Heritage and Everyday Violence. So for those of you who aren't immediately familiar with um, where we are, where we're talking about, so 
I, I, just to situate all of us, Lexington, Virginia is located about um, an hour, hour and a half's drive north of those of you um, in scenic Blacksburg. Um, and it is in the sort of west central part of the state. Um, we're located about, or I was located about an hour from um, uh, Charlottesville. And um, I spent most of my time living in either Lexington or the nearby city of Stanton while I was there. So I'm originally from Southern California. Um, and so it was very surreal for me to accept a job in 2014 as a professor of African history at Washington and Lee uh, University. There was this sort of moment of excitement and trepidation as I sort of stepped foot into a place where I was like, oh, oh, this is, this is it. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, and so I think there were multiple things at play. First off, I arrived at a place as someone outside of the South. Right. I had not lived um, or worked primarily at um, a Southern institution. And suddenly I was at sort of the Southern institution par excellence, right? There is um, specifically the issues of dealing with being at Washington and Lee. And for those of you who may not be familiar, these were some of the issues that we're dealing with at Washington and Lee. So of course, Washington and Lee University um, is, has been around since um, officially in its, in its current form since 1870, although it's been around since um, the mid 18th century. The university is named, of course, after two illustrious generals and slave owners, George Washington and Robert E. Lee. Um, during the Civil War, it was known as Washington College. And for those of you who are not familiar, in 1865, a newly unemployed Robert E. Lee um, accepted the, um, the presidentship of the university and so shepherded it um, in the last five years of his life from 1865 to 1870 um, as the leader of the university. Um, subsequently, he was buried um, in a chapel in the middle of campus. So if you're looking um, at that top photo, that's the colonnade, um, which is the sort of historic 19th century series of buildings. I taught in the building furthest on the left, which is called Newcomb Hall. Um, the building in the center is Washington Hall, which is capped with a, a statue of George Washington himself and directly opposite. So if you were standing in front of those open doors at Washington Hall, you would see directly in front of you Lee Chapel. Um, whereupon um, the place where Robert E. Lee is buried. And so Robert E. Lee was buried in this chapel in 1870. Um, other family members um, are also buried in the crypt with him. But one of the more interesting things about this chapel is that when you walk in, it is no longer a religious chapel, but it is one that is the center for um, a variety of social and educational events. Um, and undergraduates have to be in this chapel for um, the beginning of their academic um, experience at Washington and Lee, they, they, they sign a, an, an, honor, an honor pledge, um, and they do all of this in front of a statue known as the recumbent Lee. So this is the statue that you, you will see. This is um, the sort of burial, a statue of Robert E. Lee in repose. He's buried actually in the crypt of the chapel, but there, there you see him right there. And before, um, until 2014, from 1930 until 2014, there were replica Confederate battle flags that flanked this um, this statue. Um, what's interestingly enough, the flags came down three weeks before I arrived at Washington and Lee. I considered it a personal gift, how thoughtful. Um, but there was this sense that for, you know, well over 80 years, students that um, were in these sort of public spaces also not only had to participate in this sort of academic life of the university in front of the statue, but also to be surrounded by Confederate flags. These are not original flags. They were again placed in 1930 and they're replicas. Right, so there's this really backs up Ashley's um, point that these are these are specifically brought up and installed um, a generation, two generations later, right, as a type of remembrance, as a type of sort of signification. And what's what's deeply compelling and perhaps slightly frustrating about Washington and the university is that it it wants to be multiple things at once, right? It imagines itself as a cutting edge liberal arts. Um, college, right? One that um, has a great amount of sort of financial wherewithal to support its students and faculty. And yet at the same time, it also imagines itself as a lengthy heritage-based organization. Part of its specific unique educational appeal, its academic appeal, is within this sort of reinterpretation of heritage in which it is sort of imagined or, or written as a lengthy projection of, of quality and excellence over time. 
one of the things that that involves having to do is to recognize, right, that this, this institution was not only complicit in enslavement, right, the university itself, the college at the time, um, by the 1850s owned up oh, dozens of slaves, owned, owned over 50 slaves, um, each of the, um, the only white male allowed to attend students um, themselves had their own enslaved peoples there. And so this erasure is, is very common, right, this idea that, that slavery um, is, a, is an undercurrent that is then sacrificed or erased in favor of heritage, right? It wasn't until uh, 2016 that a marker even commemorating some of the enslaved peoples on the campus was placed. Um, and Robinson Hall, which is the hall, the, the building that is uh, two buildings to the right of Washington Hall, it's the last major building you see fully um, in this image, it was named after uh, Jackie Jack Robinson, who was a significant slave owner who gave a number of slaves to the institution in his will, um, and who is memorialized with a grave marker on campus as well. Um, and so we've had a lot of debates and conversations at Washington and Lee since um, about what we're going to do with this place. But in its core, Washington and Lee exists as a university that wants all things, right? It wants to be this modern, meaningful, competitive university, but it also wants to trade on this heritage. And it, when I first arrived, it was sort of immensely fascinating to see the university begin to grapple with it, but without any sort of haste. For those of you who are familiar with Washington and Lee, its motto taken directly from the Lee family is not unmindful of the future. And I love that because that is such a non-statement, right? It is, it's not mindful of the future. It's not unmindful. And I think on some levels that is actually very telling about um, the university's approach to commemoration and heritage, right? How do we think about um, the past and the present? Well, we're not unmindful of the future, but we are sort of wanting all of these things at once. This was really difficult for me personally as a historian of settler colonialism, whiteness, and power. Um, specifically, I work on questions of um, British colonial power and identity, and I look primarily in Southern Africa. Um, so to be hired here and sort of think through these things was challenging, especially to be an African-American, to be a Black person working on a place where so much of this was heavily felt. Um, and so one way that I dealt with that was that I actively teamed up with people in the community and other academics, and we formed a group um, known as CARE, which was for Community Anti-Racism anti Education. Um, and we decided that for the first time we would have a Martin Luther King Jr. parade um, in 2017. So this may sound shocking, but the city of Lexington did not have any sort of specific MLK um, sort of celebrations. And so a lot of us decided to get together and spend the better part of a year planning this MLK parade. There is a problem. Lexington is a historic place. And for those of you who are not familiar, Virginia has its own complicated relationship with the Martin Luther King Day holiday. So, <sighs> All right, so this image um, on, on January uh, 14th, 2017, really encapsulates all of the many complicated issues that we're having at Washington and Lee. So not only did we organize this first uh, Martin Luther King Day parade, um, for the city, for the for the state of Virginia, we have th this particular issue where, in 1986, when um, most states in the nation adopted Martin Luther King Day as a federal holiday, Virginia already had a holiday at this time, right? They had Lee Jackson Day um, to commemorate both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Um, between 1986 and 2000, the sort of strange compromise for this was to create Lee Jackson King Day, uh, a bizarre chimera of each of these sort of things put together. And the compromise after 2000 was that on the Friday, uh, people would celebrate Lee Jackson Day and on the Monday, which would be a state holiday, which has only recently changed. And then on the Monday would have Martin Luther King Day, which does create a bizarre blended holiday. This takes on particular significance in the city of Lexington, Virginia, where um, for well over a decade, um, the city has been host to a particular set of Confederate reenactments and parades that happened that weekend. So on Lee Jackson Day, uh, you have hosts of people that come from across the country, primarily throughout the South, um, who then arrive in full Confederate regalia, wave flags, and take up most of the city streets for the better part of an entire weekend, which ends in Martin Luther King Day weekend. 
Um, this is because both Robert E. Lee is buried on campus and Stonewall Jackson is buried in the local, um, the local cemetery in Lexington. So this becomes almost a, a type, a, sh a shrine, a pilgrimage that people go on to. As you might imagine, this is difficult and complicated for people of color. <laughs> uh, it was wild my first year. I remember standing there on the corner saying, oh, okay, this, this is it. And so in response, we, we hosted this parade and this parade um, flew right into this sort of conflict, right? We had this immediate moment of two types of memorialization. And so that's one reason why I love sharing this photo because this photo is so fraught, right? In Main Street, this is Main Street through downtown Lexington. And you can see the banner celebrating the Martin Luther King Day Parade, but you also have this, um, this, this parade that's happening of, um, of Confederate sort of commemoration and they're, they're supposed to exist simultaneously. So this is what that weekend looked like. Um, you can see in the first image, I'm actually wearing that very lovely derby on the far right and that red scarf, um, helping lead the parade. Um, and yet at the same time, we had a few hours after our parade, we had this following parade down there, right? And so in this moment, we had really an, a tense moment of, of clash of sort of how do we commemorate? How do we understand? How do we think about and make space? And it was, it was terrifying at first because we had had um, visceral threats. I was doxxed on the internet multiple times. Um, each of the major organizers of the parade um, were offered uh, police assistance um, because there were absolute threats on us for, for causing trouble and for um, you know, interrupting what was supposed to be a unilateral celebration of heritage, right? And so this parade was seen as an upstart and as a, as a threat to the town, which um, is fascinating. So we have these two moments sort of in play and that's where I really began to think in my own work, how do we think about these things together? What does commemoration mean? What does it mean to occupy space and to think through history both in the past and in the present, right? And so I thought about these sorts of moments, right? And as a historian, one always wants to give sort of dates just to make sure that we know where we're at, but I wanted to make sure that we had these sort of mapped out, right? Of course, in this period, we have the Civil War from 1861 to 1865, um, followed by not only 1870 as a significant year for the community, it's where Robert E. Lee dies and becomes memorialized, but it's also where, um, you know, we have this sort of really enshrining of theoretically black civil rights, right, in the constitution, right, through the passages of amendments. Um, through 1876 and 77, we have um, the rollback of reconstruction and sort of really the full um, beginning of white Southern control over space and sort of commemoration. 1890, of course, we think of as the nadir of the civil rights, uh, of black civil rights, the sort of height of um, sort of the creation of structural anti-black racism, right? This that is formally in sort of ensconced legally. Um, by 1930, of course, we have um, the establishment of these new flags that are put up in Lee Chapel as a reminder of this particular heritage two generations later. Between 1941 and 45, not only do we have social changes that happened during World War II and in 1948, the desegregation of the armed forces, we have a return in the beginning of the sort of civil rights movement, which Ashley sort of referenced too, between 54 and 68, where we have an upswell of black civil rights and, and a, you know, a concomitant upswell in um, the use of Confederate imagery, right? The Confederate imagery is capacious. It allows people to sort of use heritage on one level, but also particularly use the past as a way of describing, responding, or challenging moments of feeling a lack of power, right? And it's very easy for people to say that, well, we're talking about our heritage, but also it's because we feel threatened and afraid because suddenly this challenge to our existence is happening, right? So there is a way in which superficially, which isn't that people can claim this to be about heritage, right? But it is also about claiming a particular time and power relation, right? So this idea of seeing, seeing an increase in black civil rights, a turn towards memorializing and re redistributing Confederate symbols as a sense of a pushback to a lack of power, right? And finally, 1986, this is the beginning of this where we see the Martin Luther King Day sort of celebrations and sort of the last 30 years of sort of this complicated intersection in Virginia. So one thing that I began to really think about is, I mean, heritage is an industry. It is an industry here specifically in, in Virginia and especially in Lexington. I mean, 
It is a city that, that has a significant tourism industry and people come because they want to encounter history. They want to encounter a type of space. They want to go to the um, Stonewall Jackson Cemetery. They want to see his house. They want to go to the Virginia Military Institute um, where he taught. They want to walk along the, the, colonnade, the colonnade's gables and, and sort of really just feel history in space, right? And there is, of course, this moment of the memorializing of this as a lost cause, which I think has been written by so many people for, for such a length of time. The idea of this, the war and, and, its, and the, the subsequent issues that happened become memorialized and said as this sort of thing where people fought and all believed in something and it was just a cause, this sort of lost cause, which allows a recourse towards innocence. Right? It allows this myth of innocence, this idea of, well, slavery can become so abstracted from the equation in which anti-Black racism and suffering can become so abstracted in which people who do not experience the quotidian realities of anti-Black violence, they, the, both enslavement and its after effects, can then render through heritage a way of moving through spaces, of moving through violent spaces and instead encountering them almost as cosplay, right? Instead encountering them as as a type of vacation space. And so that's what brings us these sort of dueling ideologies where we have this Martin Luther King Day parade and these sort of Confederate commemorations. And one is trying to really bring to the fore a type of quotidian violence, which is a key word that I use in a lot of my own research in colonial South Africa. The idea that for societies to function, a particular amount of violence has to be meted out every day structurally to certain parts of the population. And I think that quotidian violence obviously shapes colonial South Africa, but it specifically shapes the daily contours of Virginia, both in the 19th century and today, right? This idea that this violence, the subjugation and the exploitation of black labor and existence created Lexington, right? Built VMI, built Washington and Lee, but the continued quotidian violence, right? Which I think in 2020 is even more apparent, the reality in which black Americans feel themselves to exist in a, in a separate type of existence, right? Through types of quotidian violence enforced through police brutality, enforced through um, historic wealth inequities. These types of violence still shape today and are seen in the way in which people want to move through these spaces physically, right? And so as a historian, one of the, the key texts that I like to think through is um, ironically not a historical text, but a philosophical text by um, the phenomenologist Sarah Ahmed. So I'll go back to this, but I wanted to talk about Sarah Ahmed's um, book, Queer Phenomenology, and I really want to think about this quote. So I'm going to read it. I know that you are all capable of reading, but I want to say it out loud. So um, bodies are shaped by histories of colonialism, which means the word, the world, I'm sorry, the word white as a world that is inherited or already given. This is the familiar world, the world of whiteness, as a world we know implicitly. Colonialism makes the world white, which of course, as a world ready for certain kinds of bodies, as a world that puts certain objects within their reach. Bodies remember such histories even when we forget them. Such histories, we might say, surface on the body or shape how bodies surface. Now, that's a lot of fancy academical talk. So one of the things that I love about this piece is that it points out that through types of violence, through quotidian violence, certain bodies have access to space. Certain bodies have been pushed aside and certain bodies have suffered violence to create this world. And those after effects still exist, right? And what this means is for certain bodies to move through these spaces, they don't have to think about this, right? For a, a lot of these tourists that will move through Lexington on a summer day that will take a carriage ride or drinks at the former Robert E. Lee Hotel or marvel at um, the architecture, there's not a physical sensation of the historical marker on their bodies of this sort of structural violence, right? If we think of colonialism or if we think about sort of the white supremacist schema of the, of the Confederate South as a type of disciplining project that disciplined bodies in a particular way, we still see, right, the idea in which certain bodies feel comfortable, right, and which other ones feel like they may exist under a constant state of protest. And that's part of the problem when we think about this in the academic setting, right? Is that academic settings are not only supposed to be these spaces where we learn and think and sort of dialogue, but they also exist in non-neutral realities, right? So the problem for Washington and Lee is often how do we exist in this space? 
how does this universe exist in this space with these very different realities shaped by violence? And so I wanna just spend a little bit of time, just that's, that's one of the bigger questions and issues that I find myself, I found myself in my four years at Washington and Lee dealing with, but I also wanted to apply it to my own work. Right. So one of the things that made me a better historian was working and living in Lexington, because while I was working and living in Lexington, South Africa was undergoing its own um, statue issues. Right. So I was simultaneously a historian of South Africa who would go back every summer while also living in Lexington, which made this sort of very intense for me. So simultaneously, we were having the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa, which was kicked off by the statue of arch colonialist Cecil John Rhodes, who you see to the upper right. Um, which was located um, on the UCT campus. And this began as a series of protests that began with um, people um, you know, throwing feces on the statue, people talking about what does it mean as a black person in contemporary South Africa to be surrounded by these sort of colonial statues that reinforce not only the historic violence that's happened, but remind me that I don't belong. This led to other ripple effects. Um, as you see on the lower left, you see the statue of King George V, um, which is at Howard College um, in Durban, South Africa. So the British king himself is sort of covered in white paint. The sign says, end white privilege. Um, and the protests continued throughout the year. And by the end of 2015, you see the actual removal of the Cecil John Road statue. No longer, it's no longer there today. Um, and sort of presages a lot of these Confederate statue removals that happen over the next few years in the US. Right? It also led to larger ripple effects. Um, the idea of talking about these statues being removed really meant talking about these types of quotidian violence that people experience. And so it really led to this sort of larger conversation of how do we understand how other, you know, other universities have access to, to goods, have access to services. And so overall, the larger questions that came, that came together for me were how do places imagine themselves to be neutral when they're not? And how do these types of daily violence, right? How do statues not only commemorate things, but they, they serve as location or orientation devices, right? They remind people who they are. They remind people where they've been. And they give people a sense of reassurance. At the same time, they give other people a reminder of the violence that they've encountered. So obviously none of this is neutral, but it is all deeply fraught and interconnected, much like that initial parade um, in January of 2017. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, TJ. Um, I'll also remind you all again that we do have the question and answer feature here where we're getting some questions, some fantastic questions we'll get to somewhere answering as we're going. Um, but please send them in and we'll get to those uh, at the end of this event. Our next speaker is Talby, who is an adjunct professor of history and religion and culture at Virginia Tech. Dr. Edmondson recently published an article titled, Protesting a Bigger and Better Birth of a Nation, Lost Causism and Black Resistance to David O. Silsnitsky's uh, Gone with the Wind in the June edition of the Journal of African American History. So very recent. Um, thank you very much, uh, Talby. Uh, look forward to hearing. All right, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as was just said, I am a, I'm, a, I'm a historian. I'm also an interdisciplinarian and my, my research focuses on kind of white nationalism and this lost cause mythology. And even before, you know, I got to this point to, to where I was researching what is this, this one fraternity, which if, you know, I was asked to be here, um, hold on. because I recently in early July published this article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, for those that don't know, the Chronicle of Higher Education is one of the, the bigger national newspapers for issues pertaining to, to higher education. Um, and in this article, I focused on one fraternity in particular, the Kappa Alpha Order, and uh, an experience or an incident that I, I found myself in with this, with this organization, both its local chapter at Virginia Tech, um, and also it's kind of central leadership, which aren't students there in Lexington, Virginia, we're at Washington and Lee. Um, in that way, you know, this conversation is gonna dovetail uh, really, really strongly into the, the previous two speakers. Um, because this organization was founded at Washington and Lee in 1865 when Robert E. Lee 
uh, you know, becomes the president of that university. And it's central to their identity, right? You know, not just Washington and Lee, but Robert E. Lee, you know, them himself. Uh, and these, these ideals and principles, you know, that this, this historical figure supposedly, you know, upholds. Um, and again, in this, this article, you can see the, the image of, of Lee's tomb there, um, which you already saw in Dr. Talley's. And another thing about this organization isn't just the Lee commemoration or the Lee celebration that they, they continue to do. There's also this kind of combining of, you know, uh, think about Ashley's conversation about the, the lost cause mythology, right? This kind of states rights, not slavery. It erases slavery. Um, it erases the, you know, the, the harsh realities, right? The horrors of what slavery were and kind of paints the, the South as this place populated by Southern bells and white gentlemen. Um, so they combine that type of identity also with this kind of imaginary chivalric crusader medieval knight, um, you know, myths that they, that they also kind of include in this. Um, you can see a few of that. I mean, there's, there's knight statues and, and knight regalia, you know, pretty constantly. If you look in their handbook, this comes from a student handbook called the Varlet. Um, chivalry and gentility is, you know, amongst the, the principles that they push. Um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the labels that they use, they call each other knights. All of the students that become, you know, Kappa Alphas are called knights. Uh, their leaders are, they're kind of like their national presidents, which are, are you know, individuals who were, you know, they're now alumni, they're, they're typically older, um, they're called the Knight Commanders. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty thorough. And this kind of combination or this combining of this lost cause mythology with this kind of crusader mythology from 1865 has led historically, right, not just for this fraternity to claim, you know, a kinship, um, or as it says here, an identity of purpose with, with Confederates or Robert E. Lee, but they also claim that with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, in this quote, I won't read the entire thing, but you can say, you can see the highlighted portion of the Ku Klux Klan was of contemporaneous origins and had an identity of purpose with Kappa Alpha. Um, so what we're already seeing, right, with this lost cause, you know, mythology as it was being created, right, is that there's a, an intrinsic white nationalist project, you know, that's kind of at work in it. Because part of this lost cause mythology is also not just that the Confederates, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, brave soldiers or, or fighting for a, a cause that they truly believed in. It's also that, you know, in the post-war period, whenever slavery was over, um, that the Ku Klux Klan and what they would call redeemers, uh, these white redeemers were able to put, you know, order and install order back into the South and, you know, kind of run out, you know, the freedmen, the emancipated slaves, remove them from holding political office, you know, removing the vote, you know, and therefore saving or redeeming the South. And also, you know, the, the kind of Northern carpetbagger uh, conversation comes in there, but they were saviors of this white nation, right? This, this Southern way of life. Um, and, you know, uh, the values that the old South would then have to then reinstall in the new South right, without slavery. And again, this is going to kind of dovetail straight into, you know, the Jim Crow period where subjugation was, was institutionalized. Um, you can see some more from their, their journals as well. You know, I guess I should say I found this research um, because I did have an incident with this fraternity in which, you know, I, I kind of spoke about them in my Civil War class that I was teaching um, as an organization that would be defensive uh, or antagonistic to um, saying that Robert E. Lee was a white supremacist, right? Or that he carried this white supremacy with him even to the grave. Um, and the Virginia Tech chapter got upset with that, uh, accused me of defamation, were threatening, you know, a lot of things to, to try to silence me, um, to try to force me into an apology. And then that national organization, uh, the professionals, you know, got involved um, and asked me to find this and to prove that I could you know, make statements like that in my, in my class. So um, that was kind of thrust upon me. I'll circle back to that at the end, but that's where some of this comes from. And, you know, it, it became really clear when I was putting together, you know, the identity with the, the crusader stuff with the lost cause stuff that it grafted pretty easily on top of each other. Uh, as far as white nationalist ideologies go, you know, this kind of crusader mythology um, of, you know, saving, you know, this kind of Christian holy land kind of grafts right over top of, uh, the lost cause, especially its reconstruction ideology, which I was just talking about. And here again is their, their journal um, where KA members, you know, doubtless added to the Klan's effectiveness. Um, and this was pretty common in the 1920s too, especially as the, the second Ku Klux Klan was kind of rebirthing, you know, um, partly in response, 
you know, to the birth of a nation, which kind of served as an inspiration. Um, and of course, it was reviewed pretty favorably in the Kappa Alpha Journal uh, because one of their, or probably their most prominent alumni was Thomas Dixon Jr., who wrote the source material that became the birth of a nation. Um, and he was very active in the fraternity always. He was like the, one of the, the executive editors of their journal while this was going on. He, he participated in events. Um, you can kind of get that history if you read my article that I wrote in the Chronicle. Um, but he also, you know, bases his clan uh, on what he believed, you know, were these, these kind of nightly crusaders of reconstruction. So if you watch The Birth of a Nation, you're going to see something, you know, uh, a representation of the Ku Klux Klan um, that's pretty central to that fraternity as well. Um, you know, one of our, you know, kind of a, the quintessential image of, of American 20th century racism, you know, is the, the kind of the, you know, the, the clan hood and the, and the burning cross. Um, and it all comes from here with the, the resurgence of the, the second clan, you know, using Thomas Dixon's kind of, you know, idea based on his fraternity to, to turn it into that. Um, <laughs> so really quickly, I also want to say that this isn't just a small organization. It's a national fraternity. Um, it's not the only fraternity like itself that uses these, these images. There are other fraternities that were founded in the wake of the Civil War, you know, by ex-Confederates that use some of the same symbolisms um, that were very restrictive, you know, on the members that they would allow throughout the 20th century, you know, being actively segregated. Um, and it's not the only one that uses, you know, kind of these mi medieval symbolisms either. Um, you know, there's, there's a handful that use those as well. But with Kappa Alpha, they're definitely the most Confederate. Um, they're probably the most widespread. They're at 122 different campuses, I believe, was my last tally. Um, and they're all over. It's not just a few southern states either. They're even out west um, in the north, you know, to a, to a certain extent, and the Midwest. Um, so it, it's pretty expansive. And they, you know, they, they have new organizations or new chapters that are founded, you know, every single year. Um, <laughs> but what's different about them is that they also make this kind of lost cause principles and this white nationalism central to right, their identity itself. You know, some of those other, other fraternities, it's not just like a little quirky thing that they think Robert E. Lee is their spiritual founder, right? Um, you know, or this, this celebration of Lee. It's actually just central to the principles and to the message, right, that this organization is trying to impart on what is honestly has been thousands upon thousands of young men uh, since its founding in 1865 and counting, I should say. So on their website right now, you can see that they would call Robert E. Lee, what they say is the, the spiritual founder. Um, and they, they take this mythological version of Lee that comes straight out of the lost cause, um, where he was this kind of chivalrous, gentle, kind gentleman. He is the, to K.A., he is kind of the, the paragon, right, of not just of being a Christian knight, but the Southern gentleman. He's both of those things, and he's something to be emulated because of this kind of gentility, right, that they also herald in their principles. Um, his Christianity, uh, his knowledge, there's a lot of words that they attach to it, but he, he's just kind of the, the figurehead. Um, and that's, you know, what I, what I said, it, it's, I don't want to dwell on this, but it's in no way representative of, of Rob, the, re, the real Robert E. Lee. Recent scholarship has revealed, you know, that Lee is a, a vicious, he was a vicious slaveholder. He was a, an ardent racist until he died. He was always resentful, even in the post-war period. Um, never really forthcoming with, with Congress, never, you know, never, you know, about what happened during the Civil War, um, and, you know, kind of angry uh, and vindictive. Um, so he's not really the person that they say, you know, that he is, or what you would read about, you know, on these slides. Um, <clears throat> but <coughs> uh, Lee becomes, you know, their, their figurehead. Uh, and he is something that, you know, members are supposed to look to in order to capture, right, those, those qualities and to seek to be, you know, not just good citizens as college students, but to grow up to be, right, you know, productive citizens, you know, in the world itself. But it, it comes from this strong place, right, of white nationalism itself. Um, <clears throat> and I should say that, you know, this, this fraternity, you know, as they, you know, as they venerate Lee and uh, the Confederacy itself, it becomes something that, you know, they wear on their sleeves, I should say. So if you look at this image, this is from a banquet um, it looks like 1923. So again, this is where the, the Klan veneration is, is pretty heavy. Um, you can see kind of in the background there that, you know, they're, they're leaning heavily on this kind of Old South mythology. They, they decorate their, their houses and their, their conventions to look like plantations. Um, some of these chapters, you know, and at these conventions, they would hire black servers 
um, or black musicians uh, in the 1930s. There was one example in the journal of a chapter writing in where uh, during the Great Depression, they had found, you know, some out of work and impoverished African Americans and employed them to work in their house and they bragged about having slaves, you know, gleefully in their in their journal. Um, so, you know, it, it's not just this kind of mythological lead, the racial uh, stuff is coming with that from the lost cause as well, that the South itself is a white space, right, that there should be uh, a system of subjugation to hierarchalized races in the South, particularly, you know, there are supporters of Jim Crow. Um, the journal would go on about, you know, opposing the, the dire anti-lynching legislation. Um, it's a very political organization, even though it wouldn't claim that outright. They talked about politics a lot. Um, certainly the politics of segregation, uh, the politics of lynching, um, and we're, we're always, you know, in support of those things. Um, so I guess is what I'm trying to say here is, you know, that it, it's not just, again, this kind of organization where this is just kind of a feature that they can denounce and move on from. It's so central to everything that they're doing that it's, that it's quite problematic. Um, and then in the 19th or the 20th centuries further on, and you can actually see this change historically, um, they become very uh, big supporters of Confederate commemoration explicitly. Um, you know, especially on campuses. And, you know, it's another thing that they're known for, not just this kind of, you know, worship of Robert E. Lee, but also supporting battle flags or flying battle flags. And in 1948, this really takes off. Um, there is a marked change, right, in the, in my research when I was looking into them, because that is at the point where the Democratic Party actually adopted a, a civil rights um, platform. Um, and so there's a Dixiecrat revolt, if you've heard of the Dixiecrats, who break off from the Democratic Party, you know, just to, oppose integration and oppose the civil rights movement that was beginning to grow. Um, and this organization becomes a part of that. Like I said, they're very political. They actually, um, at the Dixie Crack Convention, the, the chapter from the University of Alabama actually floods onto the floor, kind of spontaneously waving these huge images of Robert E. Lee and Confederate flags to raucous applause. Um, you can see that in the, in the newspapers. Um, again, you know, this is Silent Sam uh, at the University of North Carolina. I think some, one of the, the, the first presenters mentioned Silent Sam, you're probably aware of the controversies in the media um, going on there. Um, they, this organization was known for its old South balls where they dressed up, women wore, you know, these kind of Southern Belle hoop skirts, men wore Confederate uniforms, Confederate regalia. Um, but always this was taking place in the backdrop, right, of you know, the civil rights movement itself, especially at this point. So this is the University of Georgia, um, where in response to the integration order, right, of the campus, you know, the Kappa Alpha order flies the Confederate flag at half staff, right? So there's an explicit, you know, understanding that these symbols that they're using are for the purposes of white supremacy and for supporting, right, you know, the, the, subjugation of African Americans and also segregation in Jim Crow itself. Um, it has an explicit meaning, you know, to that organization. Um, you can see more of that, you know, in some of these, in some of these images, there's, there's been recent, you know, textbooks or not, sorry, not textbook, yearbook controversies, certainly where, you know, people have, uh, you know, found that the fraternity, um, has gleefully kind of put these, these images, you know, in there. Here's one in particular, which kind of goes back. I mean, this is 1957 um, in a University of Alabama yearbook where they're dressed up in their Confederate regalia, but it reads the Klan in their afternoon formals. Um, so one thing that I found that kind of jumps off, you know, in my research is that, you know, they, they actually call these chapters, chapters refer to themselves as clans. Um, you know, and this was the latest reference, uh, you know, that I had to that. And, you know, it's just open, it was in the yearbook. Um, you can get online right now and, you know, find this. Um, and it's also, again, like I said earlier, not just a Southern problem. I think this is a, a, something that needs to, to be kind of front and center in our understanding. This is UCLA, um, where this, uh, this also happened. Um, and I believe this was the 1960s. Um, but the KA organization grow, they're waving battle flags again, you know, in, in <laughs> not just to signify themselves, uh, but in resistance to to integration. And I should say that, you know, this resistance to integration that they had in the waving of these symbols is, is something that they believed, right, you know, kind of from their their founding, their historical founding in 1865, that they were of contemporaneous origins with the Ku Klux Klan. So they believe as an organization, it's their job, you know, to to uphold white supremacy um, and the the segregationist order that existed. Right, just like their forebears with the Klan and the original Kappa Alphas helped uphold that in order to actually institute and install Jim Crow. Um, so it, it's it's completely central to the history of this organization, and you can kind of see that white nationalism, you know, this white nationalist project. If if you really look to 
uh, the, uh, the lost cause itself. I mean, what the, the fraternity does is it kind of exposes explicitly what's really at the heart, right, of the movement that constructed so many of these monuments or that led to the birth of a nation. If you've watched The Birth of a Nation, you know, this is in its final scene, you know, where, you know, Jesus appears above the redeemed South after the Ku Klux Klan, right, had already, um, you know, they murdered their, they lynched their, their main bad guy in the movie, and then, you know, routed the carpetbaggers and the, the emancipated, um, and then Jesus appears, you know, so I should also say, I, I guess for, to be more precise, it's not just white nationalism, it's white Christian nationalism, um, that is, you know, one of the, the problem here, <laughs> and the fraternity itself makes that completely explicit. Right. So uh, what's kind of special about them, I guess, is that, you know, combining it with this kind of, you know, this medievalist mythology is it really lays it bare. So, I mean, again, you can kind of see images like this with crusaders, medieval crusaders, right, who supposedly, you know, saved the, the Holy Land from the infidels. And if you read my article, you can see that even some of the former leaders use that word in particular, right, infidel to refer to the so-called carpetbaggers or the so-called, you know, um, free African Americans, um, you know, the, you know, the, the emancipated that were running over the South and ruining the Southern way of life. Um, and it's completely central to that. Um, you can see more of that here. Uh, it's probably best just shown in images. This is again from the Varlet, um, which is a student handbook. And once it covers, you know, all of this kind of stuff about gentility and chivalry and, you know, the Knights Templar, you move into the Lost Cause explicitly with the Lee veneration. Um, you know, that's the, the next chapter. Um, so uh, at this point, you know, I've kind of laid out this, this fraternity and this kind of white nationalist project or white Christian nationalist project that kind of exists here, you know, in the Lost Cause. And that it also, you know, the Lost Cause and these, these monuments, people certainly disagree about what they mean, right? But it does appeal to, you know, some people already sympathetic, right, to, you know, this white nationalist project. And it, it, it has the ability, the Lost Cause narrative itself, to necessitate right, a protection of white supremacy. Um, and you see that over and over again by looking at the fraternity from the way that it thought about reconstruction, which was necessary um, for this, or the redemption that was necessary up to defending, right, um, the Jim Crow order, which again it saw was, was necessary. So at this point, I do wanna pivot away from that and kind of speak to something else, you know, at least the, the incident that I ended up uh, in with the fraternity. And this is the letter I received from them accusing me of defamation. Uh, later on, it accuses me of hate speech against them. Uh, as well for just saying that, you know, they, they were saying that I had linked them to, you know, uh, being racist and white supremacists themselves, even when I was just speaking about, you know, kind of this, this historical trajectory um, that, the, that these organizations like them, I actually compared them to like the United Daughters of Confederacy, which, we, which we've already talked about in their defense of Robert E. Lee. And, you know, at this point in the conversation, I, I want to use this because, you know, we, we have this academic conversation, right? Um, and it's certainly important about the environments that are created from these narratives and these symbols at our universities. But it's not just uh, uh, a, uh, it's not just an academic question or something that we're gonna theorize or track down the history on. It's, it's a real administrative problem um, that's ongoing right now. So if there's any university administrators out there, you know, this part of the conversation is for you. So uh, in the wake of my article coming out in the Chronicle, one thing that, you know, kind of surprised me is that I got a lot of, you get a lot of emails when you write something like that. Um, most of them were actually good, some of them not. But you know, I got people writing to me from the that were former members of the confed or the confederacy, the fraternity. Um, I guess it works. Um, um, you know, former members of the, the fraternity that were were grappling with these troubles, trying to move on. Um, but I also got letters from you know people that had found themselves in similar situations to me. Um, their stories weren't as crazy as and out of control as mine got with the fraternity basically daring me to find all this stuff, which is kind of amazing, right? They asked me to find that, um, you know, which I had no, no intention of doing uh, prior to that. But there were stories of, you know, one undergrad or as an undergrad, he did a, a project as a geographer where he mapped in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, is at the University of Kentucky, um, you know, symbols of racism in the wake of Barack Obama's election in 2008. And he marked the Kappa Alpha house because they had like a cannon and a flag, I think, in their yard. And it was just a project on Google Maps where he did it. But a year later, he's a grad student at the University of Kentucky and receives a letter, you know, a cease and desist letter from the Kappa Alpha lawyer in Richmond telling him to take it down. It had been seen by like 50 people or something, you know, mostly him and his professors. Um, 
So he ends up in, you know, with these legal threats that are coming his way just because, right, he did this project and accurately marked, you know, or accurately flagged, you know, these symbols on the landscape. Um, I ended up speaking with another faculty member at Hastings University um, who found, you know, themselves in this, this meeting with the, the national director of the administration or the, of the fraternity, sorry, um, and uh, her chair. Uh, because she had opposed the establishment of a chapter of this organization, you know, at, at the college. Um, so what became clear with all of these, these letters that I was getting and all of this mail is that, you know, because this organization can't actually justify itself, it can't justify these symbols, its principles, or its history, you know, in any adequate way, um, even though it claims that they spend a lot of time running around, throwing around legal threats, um, or wasting people's time or harassing people that, you know, have dared to speak honestly or to just state what's blatantly obvious, you know, about them. And that is ridiculous. Uh, it should absolutely not be happening. Um, and if they, like I said, for the administrators, you know, there, there is a job here not just to think about the environments, but not to let people get wrangled into with these organizations that are then going to end up trying to defend themselves. You know, the irony here is that I said that they would get, you know, kind of touchy about calling you know, speaking honestly about Robert E. Lee as a white supremacist and that they would debate that. And then that's exactly what they did, right? You know, I ended up face to face in these, 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 these lengthy meetings, you know, where they, they flew off the handle and got angry and it, it takes a toll, right? Um, it certainly does. It's, it, it's something that it delayed my dissertation, which I was finishing. It got pushed to the next semester. I had to pay out of pocket for a credit hour to defend it. Um, you know, uh, <coughs> Gosh, what else was there? I mean, there, there's certainly, I, I certainly know that if I wasn't, you know, a, a, a white male, um, even with the accent to speak to this fraternity, right, um, that it would have probably been a lot worse than it even was. Um, so there is a real cost and it is a real administrative problem. Um, so I guess to, to leave this conversation at that point, um, you know, if there are any administrators out there and you get a letter from the Kappa Alpha Order, you should tell them to kick rocks um, and actually have the back of your, uh, have the back of your faculty and your students. So. With that, I'll, I'll turn this over to Penny. Thank you very much, Tali. Um, yeah, so we have our, our last speaker here, but before I introduce here, introduce her, um, I'd like to remind you once again that we do have this question and answer feature, so please continue to send your questions in. We're getting some fabulous stuff and, and trying to answer as much as we can as we go. Um, Penny is a member of the school board in Franklin County, Virginia, and the only African-American member of that board. She spearheaded the effort to have the rebel flag put on the do not wear list of the school dress code for the county. Um, and we've asked her to join us here today to talk about this experience, and uh, which is fairly recent and uh, very informative. So Penny, please, we're, we're waiting to hear. Great, thank you. As the rest of the team here, I truly appreciate Virginia Tech inviting me to uh, participate in this. I am truly excited about it. As I get started, I wanted to share with everyone a little bit about the environment that I was actually working in. And by the way, I am from Franklin County. I was born and raised in Franklin County. I graduated from Franklin County High School and left for about 30 years and returned home in 2007. So as you can see, the population of Franklin County is about 56,000, mostly rural. We do have seven districts. Our county seat is the town of Rocky Mount, and we are 90% white, 8% African-American, and about 2.5% Latino. And the government structure, of course, is the Board of Supervisors, Town Council, and the School Board. And as you can see, the Board of Supervisors is all white with one white woman. Town Council is all men with one black man. And the school board, we are the most diverse. We have four men, four women, and of course myself as the uh, lone female, black female. The demographics of the school system is about the same. Uh, it dips a little bit with the white population down to 84% and the African-American population is 9%, and the Latino population is 7%. So 
So how this came about, in one of our board meetings in August, some a citizen came to the board meeting and said that they thought that they needed that we needed to change the dress code because they felt it was unfair to the ladies or the young ladies. And so it needs to be more gender neutral. And they felt it would make the students more confident and they shared with us some other dress codes that had been changed. So based on that, the school board agreed to um, change the dress code and a dress code committee was formed, which was uh, the director of instruction, as you can see a high school administrator, middle school administrator, elementary school principal, assistant principal, and some parents. They uh, looked at the dress code and looked at surrounding dress codes uh, with other dis school districts and came back to the board in October with this uh, dress code. Let me move my, this a minute, it's in my way. And as you can see, I'm just gonna read the, the last piece of it, but this was uh, the part that I asked about. Uh, well, it says all students are expected to dress appropriately for K-12 educational environment. Any clothing that interferes with or disrupts the educational environment is unacceptable. And clothing may not depict discriminatory, obscene, or hate speech imagery. Clothing and accessories that endanger the safety of others uh, may not be worn. So I ask at the board meeting, uh, let me move this a minute, is aren't children still wearing, or aren't students still wearing the Confederate battle flag to school? Because I had, um, one, I had substituted there for a number of years. And of course, I know people in the school that have teachers and students that have complained to me about the Confederate battle flag being worn. <clears throat> and I said, and I considered this to be discriminatory, obscene, and hate. So the dialogue on the, with the board went this way uh, that particular evening. I was cautioned by a board member to, not to brush everyone that uh, has the Confederate symbol as hate. In addition, um, that all their life they have been taught that the flag was heritage. And uh, the one gentleman said that he didn't display Confederate flags. He had only bought one in his life. And that was from an elderly black gentleman and he was buying it to help him out. And uh, another person on the board asked me, was I speaking for all black people? My response was, I was not brushing everyone with the same brush. All my life, I had been taught that the flag was hate. And yes, I am speaking for all black people. The superintendent then brought up the fact about the First Amendment and freedom of speech with regard to students. And he mentioned the Tinker case, which I'll talk a little more about. And he even mentioned that he had talked to me in 2015 concerning the uh, battle flag, which he had, because I called him in 2015 because a number of students had driven their trucks to school with Confederate flags on the back and parked them along the main road with regards so that the, everybody could see the flags and there were a lot of complaints. So I did talk to him about it at that time and he basically told me the same thing that he told me, was telling me that night. And then he asked the high school principal who was present that if any students had come to him with regard to uh, other students wearing the Confederate battle flag. And of course the principal said no. So then I asked the high school principal, had any students come to him about any dress code, about other people wearing their shorts too short, other skirts too short, other blouses too low? And of course he said no. And I said, that's why we have adults making these decisions. And of course, um, I did ask the director of instruction who was presenting the um, dress code, who was an African-American, if she felt that the Confederate battle flag was offensive and she agreed that she did. Uh, on this particular one, we also talked about um, children. They, they didn't come to the principal. They had, she did admit the African-American uh, director of instruction who was a principal said in the past, she was the principal, said that children had come to her because they were offended and did have a problem with the Confederate flag. But of course she wasn't able to do anything about it because it was against the dress code. So another board member asked that our attorney look at it from a legal perspective. So we uh, closed the conversation that evening. 
from the um, right after the meeting, I knew that this could be a hot potato. So I was trying to prevent it from being a hot potato and share with the board the background or the African-American perspective of the Confederate flag. And one of the quotes that I put in there, uh, my father used to always say uh, to me all the time, and it's uh, basically from a Martin Luther King quote, is a large part of where you stand depends on where you sit. So I told, I shared with them the different views that people have from a cultural or historical perspective, and also what African Americans base their view with regard to the Confederate flag on. And it was because of white supremacist groups and hate groups. It, it's about how it was used in the past and it's about how it is used currently. And I shared with them some of the examples. And when we see the Confederate flag displayed somewhere as African Americans, it tells us do not end, that we are not welcome. And if it's displayed at a store, then we don't enter that store. But if it's displayed in the school system where you have to go to school and you have to go to work, then we have no choice. But it is a problem for us. And when we see this flag, we think of slavery, we think of the N-word, we think of lynchings, night riders, KKK, and all the abhorrent things that have been done to African Americans in, in America. I also shared with them an article from the Roanoke Times a 2015 article by uh, Dr. Reed from Virginia Tech, who is also the director of race and social, the social policy research. Of course, I got no response from that. And that was in October. So the attorney, our attorney, the board attorney, sent us an email and he said, the question presented is, can the Franklin County School Board, this, Thing keeps getting in my way. Okay, there we go. Can the Franklin County School Board include the banning of the Confederate flag or symbols relating to the same as part of its dress code? From there, he cited five cases and went through and shared with us uh, what the cases meant. I won't go through the detail of those, but those are the five cases he cited. And then from those, he said, his legal analysis is the Tinker case was the most important. It's the landmark decision on student free speech in the school. The Tinker, the Tinker case provided a constitutional framework for us to review student speech. And basically this was a case in the 60s during the Vietnam War when a number of students wore a black armband to school. And the administration of the school basically uh, told them they couldn't wear the armbands. The students complained and sued the school system. The lower court agreed with the school system, but the, the students appealed it and the Supreme Court reserve uh, basically overturned the lower court and said that they reversed the lower court decision because the wearing of armbands was entirely divorced from actually or potentially disruptive co conduct by those that participated in it. So this was the case that we were basing our, or we were supposed to base our decision on. His legal conclusion was that the Tinker case had the standard test for the prohibition of student speech. Uh, none of the exceptions cited in the other cases, so the other four cases did not apply to our particular situation. He recommended that we adopt the dress code as, as written and then he talked more about and then he even explained what disruptions would be and disruptions would include violence at school or threats of violence at school so part of the conversation turned into why would we have to have an actual fight in the school system before we could ban the flag and etc in our november board meeting of course um, african-american citizens start coming to the meeting and we had a room full of African-American citizens and some that spoke. The NAACP president happened to be a veteran and a minister. And uh, he started his speech with that he was really upset that he had to come and speak on Veterans Day as a veteran about the Confederate flag when he has fought and defended the American flag. 
Other citizens talked, such as uh, one citizen that was a doctor in education who happened to be my sister. Another teacher spoke, another citizen uh, who happened to be my, my sister, and a veteran. I also provided examples of racial issues within the school because at that time I was talking to teachers and students and parents and collecting information about different incidents that had occurred at the school. And of course, I've had nieces and nephews in the school system, so I was aware of some uh, specific issues also. Uh, and I must say the board was much more considerate with their responses now that we had a room full of African Americans in the room, in the place. I did garner support. Uh, one of the places is the Montgomery County School Board member. There's an African American on the Montgomery uh, School Board that uh, she and I know each other. And I was aware that they had banned the Confederate flag in 2015. So she shared with me that information. Uh, I was in conference with the professor that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Reed. And at that time, it just happened to be in, when we had the VSBA conference, which is a statewide school board conference. And I tried to garner support from other African American school board members and our superintendents, but uh, that uh, didn't go, go too well uh, because everybody uh, was basing it basically on the Tinker case. And in some areas, this is not a problem. For instance, if you're in the Tidewater area where there are a lot of African American students, or maybe in Northern Virginia where there are a lot of African American students, you don't have this problem. And then there's all, I also have a neighbor that's a retired, retired attorney that would call me every now and then that was, became very interested in the story. So the Af now this was um, a little disappointing, but uh, not totally surprising to me. There was an African American citizen meeting that happened uh, prior to the December board meeting, which I was not aware of. And there were 16 participants, uh, the director of instruction of the, uh, the school system, a couple of Ferrum College students, a couple of high school students, minister, retired teachers, retired citizens, NAACP representatives, and Ferrum College administrator. And at that meeting, they decided that we should not continue to move forward asking the school system to ban the Confederate flag. So of course I attend the meeting still with the same mindset that I'm working to ban the Confederate flag. Other speakers were speaking to ban the Confederate flag and then some speakers were speaking not to ban the Confederate flag. So it's a little bit of confusion. And let me move this. Oh, I didn't find out until the next day that this meeting had actually taken place. And uh, one of the ways well, someone called me and shared with me uh, that the meeting had taken place, but the superintendent had not shared all that was presented in the meeting. Along with uh, my sister ran into uh, a gentleman that had been participating in the meetings and asked why was I still trying to get the flag banned? And that's how we found out about this meeting. So he and I met and had a chat and he wanted me to not get upset about it and why was I trying to ban the flag and I shared with him why. I also told him that I would not get upset about it because no one understood African American history better than me. I consider myself a history buff. And that's not only the history of African Americans with white Americans, but also our history with each other. One of the good positive things that came out of that meeting was that a retired administrator also wrote a letter. And in that letter, I found some uh, very good nuggets that I was able to start working toward. One, he mentioned that Albemarle County had banned the Confederate flag in April of 2019. And I called up the superintendent and he is the one, the board didn't ban it, he banned it and was based on the, the the marches in Charlottesville. Then Bedford County had tried to ban the flag, but it failed. But I also called some board members over there to get some information. But this was the key. Lada, South Carolina banned their flag in 2013. And I mentioned earlier about the Hardwick case. So I, at, so I actually called the Lada school and ended up speaking to a couple of gentlemen that actually participated in the case. 
and they gave me uh, some great information, which I, I'll share in a minute. But in the meantime, we had our January 13th board meeting and we voted on the dress code and I proposed that the dress code include the ban of the flag and it fell four to four. And then someone proposed that we pass the dress code without the ban and it passed six to one with me being the one no vote. Now this is the good information that I found uh, when I uh, called that aside. They actually sent me a recording of where the judge is talking about the case and where he ruled in the case. And I, as someone else said earlier, I'm sure that you all can read, but I want to read the specific information. The First Amendment in the school system context. Banning the flag is not taking a political stance. It is taking a stance that based on the history of the flag and black and white tension in the community and country that the flag can cause disruption in the learning environment. Student freedom of speech has to be within the context of the school system. The school system has to balance students' First Amendment rights with their school context. The school's purpose is to educate. Therefore, the school system has to factor in how to keep a semblance of order. They must make judgments concerning dress code. With the racial unrest in today's society, you have to have your head in the sand if you don't think it is reasonable to believe wearing the Confederate flag would cause disruption in the learning environment in school. So I sent this along with some other questions to our attorney and asked him to explain why this Hardwick case, which was tried in the, the fourth district court in Richmond, Virginia, why this wouldn't take precedence over the case that was tried at the Supreme Court in the 60s. His, this is his response to me. On the 27th, he said the most, and it was a lot longer than this, but he said the most important case to us is the Tinker case, and it still takes precedence. It was decided by the United States Supreme Court and is binding in all states. And of course, uh, I didn't truly accept this, so I continued to work. I was getting um, emails from a lot of people and most of them were positive. Uh, you can see that I even got uh, emails as far as France, Richmond, Virginia, Wisconsin, South Carolina. I was very proud of one email that I got that was very negative, and I responded to it in a very positive manner, shared with this person why I was doing what I was doing, and he responded back to me in a very positive manner. And of course, I, uh, uh, news outlets were calling me, the Roanoke Times, WSLS Channel 10, and the one that helped me most, I would say, well, I shouldn't say most because the Washington Post found out about it because of the Roanoke Times, but the Washington Post. The Washington Post, after we, um, it failed, they wanted to do an interview with me, which I did grant. And I will say that the majority of the board meetings then were tumultuous and contentious. And I was not allowed to put this back on the agenda after the January meeting when I would want to put it on the agenda, uh, one of the unwritten rules, and I say unwritten rules, this is one of the reasons I have an issue with our board is that we don't have documented governance and how we're supposed to operate. But when I go to conferences, I have never met another board that didn't have documented governance on how they are to operate. So anyway, our unwritten governance is that two people have to want something on the agenda before it can be put on the agenda. So I was allowed to put it on the agenda. But African-American citizens continued to come and speak in public and the community could actually see how dysfunctional our board was as far as the chair and the co-chair facilitating our meetings. Now I want to share this. Uh, because uh, as me, the different media did uh, ask for input, and there's a Franklin County High School paper called The Eagle. They asked all the board members why they voted the way that they did, and some of us responded. And basically my response, I just highlighted, 
that I was responsible for providing the best environment for all students. I shared with them the historical and the current use of the flag. I talked to them about some of the things you all have been talking about, heritage versus hate. And this is also why leadership needs diversity. And even respecting the Civil War veterans, the Union and the Confederate, you would want to retire the flag. Uh, there's even comments where Robert, General Robert E. Lee said we should retire the flag. Uh, as somebody said earlier, the purpose of the Civil War, there's a lot of information with regard our different views on the purpose, but I always send people back to the documentation of the actual war itself from the people that fought the war. From a standpoint, soldiers do not decide why a war takes place. The people in charge decide why the war takes place. And so the vice president of the Confederacy, along with the, all the letters of documentation of the different states seceding from the Union tell you why there was a war. But bottom line, whether you think it was about slavery or not slavery, at the end of the war, the African-Americans were free. If the South had won, the African-Americans would not have been free. Then I talked about history versus admiration. When you put up statues away flags, that is admiration. And I do that for the American flag. But history is taught in museums and schoolrooms. And then I even talked about how some of my letters talks about how shocked they were that this is even still an issue in 2020. And then, of course, I talked about freedom of speech. And I also let them know that I believe that Franklin County was and I pulled this from the Washington Post and they wrote that he Ban. The ban was not necessary because most students don't find the flag upsetting. And I've shared with you that uh, about 90% of the students are white. Uh, in the eight years that he was superintendent, the school had not witnessed a single fight related to the Confederate gear, nor a single formal complaint. One of the issues that I brought up at the meeting is when there are fights in the school system, we document there's a fight. We do not document why there's a fight. And I shared with them where there had been issues with the Confederate flag and African-American children being called the N-word and being suspended by their retaliation. Another one was uh, a little rebel flag on a jacket. Our students don't mind. They're not outwardly bothered by it. It's not a significant issue. In Southern Virginia, the flag is part of everyday life, flown prominently on vehicles and raised on poles outside stores. It's not a hate thing. For our students, for our students, if they were wearing it, it's just apparel. And this was a very interesting one. He said he even supported a teacher once with regard to wear, uh, who asked a student to remove contact lenses that made it look like you. Every time you looked at that person, you see cat eyes. Now that was a disruption. So in our next board meeting. Since I was not able to bring it up on the agenda um, after the public comment, at the very end of the meeting, there's always a time frame. Do school board members have anything else? So this is what I shared with the public. I said, I apologize to the community. They have taken their time to come out and how they feel about the Confederate battle flag. Based on the Washington it is obvious our superintendent has not heard a word you have said. However, don't feel bad. I have been on this board for six years and he has not heard a word that I have said in six years. And of course, this wasn't uh, taken too kindly. From there, he wrote me a letter. And of course, there's more to the letter than here, but I just pulled out these items. It's talked about me uh, having the feel, feeling the need to apologize to the community. What I said was not true, but the board, uh, but the community and the newspaper wasn't aware. Uh, his stance was that the school was not on legal ground. Uh, only three students wear the flag anyway. 
Um, there's no substantial disruptions. And bottom line, with all these additional items, he talked about me offending the school board members, uh, my family offending the school board members, and that if we did not stop, then he was going to sue us. One of the problems that they had with me was that I actually said the N-word versus saying N-word, and they were so offended by it. And I said, but you're so offended by me saying it. Why aren't you offended enough for us to do something about the children that are being called that? And there was never a response to that. So my response to him was that I considered his email and others that he sent to me and other board, what other board members have sent to me as slanderous, threatening, and without basis of fact. In addition, my family's comments and mine, we are following protocol and procedure. And it was not surprising to me that he addressed me and my family, but did not address other board members and their families, which he had actually seen what was being done. Some of those was, was um, the vice chair uh, at that last meeting when someone, another member asked to speak about something, he, she allowed him to speak. So then when I said Madam Chair and wanted to respond to that, she wouldn't allow me to speak. And I said, why not? She said, because. So I said, well, I'm going to speak anyway. Then her husband from the audience hollered out that I was out of order. No one else on the board said anything. I had to tell him that he was out of order because no one is supposed to be talking. But of course, my brother was there at that time. I said, yeah, because if he can talk, I can talk. And I said, yes, you're right. And at the end of the meeting, he comes up to where his wife is and my brother comes up to me and, so, and they ask him if he's my brother. And he says, yes, I'm her brother and I'm her protector. And then that gentleman uh, who was her husband had already told everybody he, he spoke in the public meeting and at, earlier and told everybody to just get over it and then said to my brother, Jesus loves you. And my brother asked him, yes, I know he loves me, but does he love you? So based on that, we actually finally had a meeting um, where the chair and the vice chair agreed to attend class. That was one of my issues is that they were um, chairing and trying to chair the meeting, but had never even been to the seminars uh, from the VSBA on how to do that. I agreed to uh, not use the N-word anymore. I was asked why blacks were allowed to say the N-word and whites were not. So I gave them an education on that. And uh, they, once a board decides on something, everybody's supposed to be in agreement. And I let them know that there was no way that I was going to walk out of this room, uh, out of that room, and agree that it was okay for the Confederate battle flag to be flown or in the school system, that that was not going to happen. Um, after that, I did call the sheriff and I met with the sheriff uh, about a couple of days later. And I took the sheriff, I shared with the sheriff all the things that had been happening in the meetings along. I took uh, letters and emails that I had been sent from board members and the superintendent that I didn't find too flattering prior to this. And asked him to make certain that someone was at the meetings. So March uh, timeframe, the local support dwindles. You know, people kind of get restless and think it's not going to happen. Um, I was told by some African Americans that this battle that we shouldn't pick right now, the climate's not right. Plus, we want an African American superintendent. So what maybe we need to be quiet. Um, few people, few black people start showing up at the board meeting. And a uh, few people spoke during public comment. But my family was always there. Uh, they continued to speak. And I continued to talk about the flag and I was not giving up. The other piece about the Washington Post was they cited two cases, the Tinker case that our attorney talked about and the Hardwood case that was the latter South Carolina case. And it gave me more information. It said that um, the Tinker case helped set, well, the Hardwood 
Hayward case that was tried in Richmond in the fourth district helped set a more expansive definition of what counts as significant disruption. So the court ruled that officials in Lotta, South Carolina, Dillon County, South Carolina, did not violate the constitution by having a student not wear the Confederate flag. And the judge's preference uh, a proven history of racial strife at the school. So this gave me some additional information. On June after uh, Mr. George Floyd's murder, Prince William County School Public Superintendent uh, posted a letter and I just took excerpts from it. It basically said that they were proud of their diversity as the majority minority school division, we must not simply celebrate diversity and equity, we must actively pursue it for all of our students. Furthermore, we must be vigilant in promoting anti-racism. Symbols matter and actions matter. And they plan to rename two of their schools, I think a high school and a middle school, it's currently named Stonewall Jackson, they're going to rename that. And he also banned the Confederate flag. So June the 5th, I took this and I shared it with all the school board members. The following day, I wrote an email. And I included the portion of the Washington Post that talked about the fourth district um, ruling uh, in the um, Hardwick case and how it did not have to be a, a actual fight, but just issues within the school system, racial issues in the school system and the community. Then I documented for them uh, racial issues that had happened in the school system and racial issues that have happened in the Franklin County community. And then the last thing I attached was the NAACP 2018 proposition with regard to wearing Confederate paraphernalia in the school system and what it does to African-American students. And then one of the big things that had happened, uh, it was near graduation. And so of course, everybody's graduation was a little different this year. So school finished, but the students went to the beach before we actually had the graduation. So there was a video uh, going around social media where there were uh, mostly white students at the beach singing a song with the N-word in it. And they kept singing with the N-word in it. So the principal posted an apology on the, the high school website and the responses that he got from the African-American students about how racist the school system is and that they didn't care and all those types of things. So I also included that. So needless to say, at the next board meeting, I had planned to bring it up again at the end of the meeting as I had done in the past. But another board member, uh, amended the agenda at the very beginning of the meeting and wanted to add it to the agenda. Another, a second board member seconded. We had a very short discussion, so, which means to me that there had been discussion before, but I definitely, uh, I confirmed with the attorney that we were on legal ground with this. And so then there was a vote of six to zero that we would ban the flag and two people abstained. So I'm happy to say the union still stands. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any time for uh, Q and A uh, today, um, but we did get some very rich information. Hopefully, some of you, most of you, had your uh, questions answered as they came up. Um, one of the last things that I will close with is that we will be having some more of these events, but also a lot of these conversations are they're historically based, obviously, as, as you've been hearing, but they're also deeply rooted in a lot of the things that are affecting Virginia and the country and, and the globe at large. And these are things that we'll continue to move forward with and to discuss in our classrooms and in our research as uh, scholars and um, also the, the public that we welcome onto our campus as well. So in, on behalf of Virginia Tech, the Department of History and the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much to this uh, lovely panel that took the time out of the day to talk about these very, very important issues. Thank you very much. And again, this video will be available hopefully within a week or so with closed captioning. Thank you very much. And I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you.